Hello, my name is Jolt Katona, and I'm here with my colleague Tom Lee in our fantastic uh, virtual room at the Haas School of Business. Uh, we thought that we'd put together a short video for you uh, summarizing our thoughts on the pandemic. Tom? Thanks, Jolt. Together, we run the Fisher Center for Business Analytics here at Haas. Zolt is the faculty director of the center and teaches in the marketing group. Uh, I am the Director of Data Science at the Center and teach in the Operations Group. Together, our center focuses on uh, coordinating the research at the Haas School of Business around how businesses can exploit data to extract business value. Of course, today, there's data all around us front and center because of the coronavirus. As we think about how you, you in your business as a leader can extract value, we like to teach in a framework that identifies three pillars. The first uh, and foremost, of course, is the idea of data. How do we think about data and its influence on our decision making? More importantly, however, is the idea that data alone does not exist in a vacuum. And so we need to think about the processes by which that data is gathered and the processes that are being transformed by or driven by that understanding of the data. And then finally, to recognize that those processes include any number of stakeholders. So people play a critical role in the transformation of your organization in response to the data about this pandemic. Joel? Yeah, so I think that as much as this crisis is a health crisis, a public health crisis, or as it is an economic crisis, uh, in my mind, it's also a, a data crisis. So why do I say that? Well, the very first thing when I when I first heard about this pandemic early January, I was kind of following it early on because I was uh, supposed to travel to Asia, so I had to really uh, get a sense for what's going on there. But the very first thing I wanted to know is what is the fatality rate? I mean, it's kind of understandable that everybody wants to know what is the likelihood that if they get the disease, then they die. So how do we calculate this? Well, on the surface, it seems very simple. You just take the number of people who die from the, from the virus and then divide it by uh, the number of people who are infected. Uh, putting aside any, any time lags uh, 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 in deaths, because it takes uh, time for people to die after they get the, uh, get the virus, the big problem is that both the numerator and the denominator in, in, in this uh, equation is extremely... Uh, low quality uh, data. Uh, so it's, it's very hard to get an accurate measure on the number of infections. Um, you hear about uh, lack of testing. Most people who are infected are probably not tested. So you do not get confirmed uh, cases. And those are the ones that are reported as infections. So, so we really have no idea uh, about the real extent uh, of infections because the measurements are just not there. But but even the numerator, the number of deaths, it is kind of uh, uh, hard to get an accurate number on, th on that because you, you, you might say like, well, death is a death, uh, and sure, deaths are usually counted fairly accurately, uh, but is that death a result of the virus? Was that death caused by the virus or something else? And there's arguments going both ways. There's arguments saying that uh, these are overcounted, and also that uh, they are undercounted, uh, which is more likely to be true, uh, because you know you do not uh, see, uh, you, you do not confirm uh, that a death has occurred as a cause of the virus unless you do a very detailed post mortem. It's it's not enough to just do uh, kind of a test because may, the person might have died from something else, else, a car accident, and could have been infected. So even though. Uh, the, the person who died was infected, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that the death was caused by the infection. At the same time, it's very easy to miss deaths. Um, unfortunately, there are people who died home, like in Italy, we have we heard some stories, and, 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 and they're never reported, or, or hospitals are overwhelmed, and they just can't report all the deaths. So both of these numbers are fairly inaccurate. Uh, so all, all the data that we see here is, 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 is very low quality. Tom, would you agree? Zolt, absolutely. Uh, the, that broader question of the accuracy of the data is highlighted by the inconsistency between the numbers that are reported. That's something that we call data semantics. 
The idea is that even if everyone could report in a consistent fashion, understand that the definitions that we see behind those numbers uh, sometimes vary between countries, even within a country from state to state. To bring that into the context of business, many of you are probably familiar with financial metrics like a PE ratio, a price to earnings ratio. On its face, that seems like a fairly obvious, uh, def there seems to be a fairly obvious definition. I take the price of, uh, of a particular firm and I divide it by its earnings. And yet that turns out to be much more complicated than we think. If we take the price of a security, are we asking for the 52 week high or the 52 week low? Are we asking for the day's opening price, perhaps the day's closing price? If we want to divide it by earnings, what's the figure that we use for earnings? Are we using it uh, exclusive of taxes, uh, of deductions? And that same idea turns out to apply in the context of the coronavirus. When we take a look at something like infection rates and we think about the number of individuals that have been infected, we realize that how we even, uh, Joel uh, spoke a minute ago about who we actually test, but even the nature of what that test actually is, perhaps in some places, uh, what they would do is apply a polymerase, chain, a polymerase chain reaction or a PCR test based upon a mouth swab. But do they swab at the front of the mouth or at the back of the mouth? Uh, as the disease matured and spread in certain locations, they relied not upon a single test, but they had to test and a patient had to receive two positive swabs in order to be categorized as a uh, COVID positive patient. Uh, many of you may be familiar with uh, a huge discontinuity in the reporting out of China in January. You may recall that overnight, virtually overnight, in a 24-hour period, the number of infections jumped by 19,000. Is that because the virus all of a sudden exploded? That 19,000 represented something like a 40% jump in the number of confirmed cases. And yet it had nothing to do with the, inf well, not nothing, but it was not a function of the infections. It was because China had changed their definition. Rather than relying solely upon a PCR test, they began to categorize patients based upon a chest CT. So using imaging, they were looking for signs of a particular strain of pneumonia inside their patients and used that to categorize a positive. And so understand that as you look at these statistics and think about their implications for your organization, you need to think about, are you actually comparing apples to apples? Of course, in any sort of analytics, we always need to understand the underlying definitions that we face. And of course, uh, while I'm not a labor economist and neither a result, uh, many of you may, may be familiar, our own government uh, and the Bureau of Labor Statistics has, over the course of many years, changed the definition of something like unemployment. And curiously enough, every time they change the definition of unemployment, the rate goes down. And so as you think about these numbers, think about what are the definitions that underlie them, and particularly for global firms, do those numbers, or rather are those numbers comparable? Yeah, it's fascinating how these definitions are so crucial. Unfortunately, there's no, uh, there's no, no matter how they count unemployment now, it's radically increasing. Um, but like when, when we think about how to get out of this, one of the, one of the crucial things, as, as, uh, as Tom mentioned, is one is definitions. And, you know, they're, they're changing that all the time. I mean, today is April 18th. So obviously we, we talk about what we know today and you might be watching this video much later. But uh, China just changed uh, yesterday or uh, two days ago. Uh, the, their definition of debts, for example, they, they counted a lot of extra debts, so they added like a thousand debts. Uh, same with New York, they are now reporting probable debts as well. But what's really important for, for policymakers and businesses to understand uh, when we think about reopening is, is how pre prevalent this disease is in, is in society. So when we think about uh, data, it's just an observation, it's kind of think of it as a sensor, uh, are you infected or not? Um, but there's another test uh, that doesn't look for the virus, but looks for previous infections. Th those are the antibody tests. So these are like two different sensors, if you think of it that way. One detects current infection, and then the other detects whether you had it before. Uh, and you know the antibody test is, is probably much more important on the long term, uh, because we don't just look at a snapshot, but we hopefully kind of get the aggregate number of people who were infected.
but but the but the really important uh, problem here is is who gets tested. So right now, uh, antibody tests are not very widely available. But even the the, vi the viral tests, the the ones that uh, Tom mentioned, uh, the PCR tests, very few people can can get them. Uh, so it's mostly the people who are who show serious symptoms that that get them. So of course it's not very representative uh, what uh, the positive test rate is among those people. What we really need is something like what uh, what you do when you do a political poll. What we need is a random sample of the population tested that's representative of the entire population. Uh, well, of course, ideally, you would want to test the entire population, but we have not, nothing close to that in, in testing capacity. So the next best is to select a random sample. And there are a few studies that have done this in, in Austria, for example, or, or recently, this just came out uh, two days ago. Again, today is April 18th uh, from Stanford. They did an antibody test and, and they, they kind of tried to do random sampling. Uh, and they found that... Uh, Santa Clara County has, has not found uh, in their confirmed cases uh, most of the infections. In fact, they're saying that uh, there's maybe 50 or 80 times more infections that have been confirmed uh, by, by tests. And, and you know, this is like a staggering difference. And it's super important for policymakers and businesses to understand, like, what percentage of people have already been infected? Because that gives us an idea about uh, the fatality rate. So, so in some sense, you would say like, oh, it's bad news that more people got infected. But actually, uh, uh, there's a lot of positives to it because uh, as long as the deaths are not miscounted by a magnitude, this means that the more people infected, the lower the fatality rate. So that's overall good news. And also, the more people that have been infected, uh, imagine if like it's 80% already, and that's yeah, when uh, this herd immunity uh, idea comes in. The more people infected, uh, the less likely that they'll get infected in the future. So, so there's a lot of positives to, uh, to finding out that there's actually a lot more infections out there. But of course, it also changes the equation in terms of how much we have to distance ourselves. Uh, because, you know, they say that act as if you're infected. Uh, everybody should act as if they were infected. Well, maybe we are closer to that than we, than we initially thought. So Tom, so how do we how do we recover? How do we come out of all of this? Well, you know, one of the great ways of thinking about this, uh, as Zolt was just talking about, Zolt was talking about the a, a process question, right? And and as an operations person, of course, I like to think in those terms. Zolt was talking about the notion of process, the process by which we test. More generically speaking, as we think about coming out, as you as an organization begin to think about how you open up, we need to think about how we diffuse the viral infections. So on a, on a first order, we happen to live here in the San Francisco Bay Area, where we were fortunate that our uh, government uh, was an early adopter of sheltering in place, of self-quarantining. And so in that context, limiting the spread of the virus. And of course, all of you by now have heard that phrase, flattening the curve. But it's important to recognize that the, the policy of actually isolating individuals and, and quarantining each of us in our own homes does not in and of itself actually do anything to flatten the amplitude of this curve that they refer to. It doesn't decrease the severity of any surge that could occur when, when and if the economy sort of opened up uh, in a single flash and people came into contact with one another again, right? So really what we're talking, what what uh, is what Zolt was just referring to, this notion of if one wants to decrease the amplitude of the surge to degree, decrease the severity of a surge in infections, what we need to do is to think systematically about how to decrease uh, the infections, uh, rather the rate of the infections. And uh, another way of thinking about it is how to slowly diffuse the virus throughout our population so that we understand that, well, many people will contract the infection, but to hopefully do so at a more measured rate. And so, of course, part of that process then involves the testings that uh, Zolt was just talking about, but that merely allows us to identify uh, whether we, we are succeeding at diffusing the disease throughout the population. 
right? Before we have any sort of vaccine, before we have uh, what we think of as efficacious treatments, what we need to do is uh, slowly allow the herd immunity within the population to grow. And so within your own organization, the challenge is to think about how to uh, slowly reintroduce contact in a way that, that legitimately but uh, sort of uh, legitimately, but will also recognize the reality of increasing infections within your own employee population, but to do so in a measured way so as not to adversely impact the operations of, of your organization. Yeah, so, so, so the last piece of this that Tom is kind of getting into is, is the people part. So we talk about the data, low quality data process, uh, but let's not forget about the fact that people react and people react in uh, very uncertain ways. We don't really, we can't really predict how people react to something that is unprecedented. Uh, so for example, the social distancing policies, are they working? Are they not working? I mean, in theory, they should uh, reduce the number of contacts, uh, but, but how much they are actually needed as, uh, as a policy? Uh, so there are some studies that showed that people are actually stay home because they are scared, uh, even if they are not ordered to. Uh, there's a, a study in Washington State that looked at uh, the mobility of people. So you can now, uh, you know, all, all these privacy worries about mobile data, but uh, apparently this is uh, a good use. Uh, so when, when you look at how people move around and look at their GPS signals, they have observed that people started in, in um, King County, Washington, I believe, that they started uh, moving a lot less even a week before uh, the official order uh, to stay at home. So there's so many elements here where people's reactions are super important. Uh, I've just seen a, a, another study that uh, com sounds completely plausible that uh, the governors who introduced these orders uh, they, they were not necessarily driven by the, the exact level of inf infections and confirmed cases and exact predictions, uh, but, but also driven by what other governors did or uh, kind of political considerations, Democratic versus Republican, uh, that also might have played uh, a, a role in their, in their decisions. Um, and and these, are, these are all people issues. And if you and if you think at your organization's uh, level, you have to you have to consider these because you can't just flip a switch and uh, tell people, okay, you were banned from traveling. Now you can travel because people might be scared. Uh, and the media actually plays a role here. Uh, um, what do they report? Do they report on the numbers or do they report uh, stories that touch your heart? And some of these stories are tragic, uh, and and they should report them when when uh, people who are in their 40s and 30s and healthcare workers die. But, but those seem to be more, uh, more the exceptions. The fatality rates for below 60 are, are, are actually fairly low and much lower than above, above 70, 80. Uh, but if people don't have a, a good sense of what is safe and what is not safe, uh, then they'll, they'll react to that. So at your organization, you have to think about all these questions. and. And, and you might say like, well, it's, it's for the government to decide. And that might be true for, for maybe April where there's all these strict orders and everything is closed down. But, but as we re reopen, each individual business unit or business and actually each individual has to make certain decisions. How do you, how do you reopen? What are your travel policies? What are your workplace policies? And these have to be based on data, but you have to take into account the low quality data. You have to take into account the process, how that data was obtained. And then you have to take into account how people uh, will react uh, to your policies. So these, these are all very hard questions. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have better data, but, that, but that's what we have to deal with. Um, you know, when, when uh, we teach with Tom, uh, it, it is not unusual uh, to face situations, uh, for businesses to face situations and for us to give examples where they have very low quality data, but they have to make big decisions on it. Uh, so in some sense, uh, some sense, this is similar. Tom, would you agree? Oh, absolutely, Zolt. I think that whole notion of understanding the implications of that data and understanding what it means to... Uh, in the case of the coronavirus, what it means to delay an onset as opposed to actually decrease amplitude, to actually diffuse or flatten. 
Uh, that's the challenge that faces our organizations today. Well, hopefully uh, you found our video useful in kind of uh, trying to manage uh, the, the hope, hopeful uh, reopening of the economy. And, you know, I, I think there is a fine line between overreaction and being irresponsible. And finding that balance is, is going to be hard. And hopefully this uh, framework of data process people will help you with that. Thank you for joining us.